Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for joining us for this panel on unveiling the future of uh, infrastructure and transport corridors. We are going to be rather prompt uh, because of the time. Uh, and uh, as everyone has been introduced, uh, I will uh, go ahead and jump straight into uh, matters uh, with Abdullah, if you don't mind, especially that we just saw the signing uh, right now of uh, Mawani. If you would be let, you know, letting us a bit know a bit more about um, how will the new logistics infrastructure and corridors, including this agreement with the Port de Marseille and France, uh, impact Saudi Arabia's position in global trade? I would be, I'm sure everyone here wants to know more about the signing. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to say thank you for Business France. Uh, we, are, we are strong partners. We have uh, worked together. Uh, by creating the French uh, Saudi Maritime Days. Uh, it was the last year event. Uh, it was very successful uh, with uh, multi uh, participation from international companies in France and Saudi Arabia. And uh, from uh, that event as well, we have seen uh, today another milestone. Uh, that is the signing agreement uh, with the Port of Marseille uh, with the Saudi Port Authority. Uh, of course, uh, Saudi Arabia going into a uh, big transformation where uh, if, uh, in 2021, the national transport and logistics strategy was launched by His Royal Highness, the Crown Prince. Uh, and the aim objective of that is actually to make Saudi Arabia a, log a global logistic hub. So uh, of course, uh, uh, the focus in all aspects, aviation, maritime, ports, land, uh, and even rail. And in the maritime, of course, we need to look at our uh, partners and work with international partners to see how we can collaborate together, work together to reach to our objective, uh, and uh, also uh, to have a win-win uh, situation uh, together. Speaking of, of corridors, uh, Mr. Mistrali, uh, you know, can you please let us know what are the main objectives of the Middle East Europe Economic Corridor? Okay, thank you very much. Um, the IMEC is uh, uh, India, Middle East, Europe Economic Corridor. It has been signed by eight chiefs of states uh, in uh, last uh, September on the sidelines of the G20 meeting. The eight uh, Chief of State are uh, Mr. Modi from India, the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman from Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Zayed from the Emirates, plus four Chief of State from Europe, uh, our President Emmanuel Macron, and the Chancellor Scholz from Germany, um, Mrs. Meloni from Italy, and uh, Ursula von der Leyen in the name of the EU, and Joe Biden. The, um, the idea is to, to create a corridor in order to increase the connectivity between India, the Middle East, and uh, Europe. I don't know if you see, you, perhaps you will see the, the, the map uh, on, the, on the screen. Um, there will be three legs. First, a maritime leg between India and uh, the Middle East. Secondly, on the land, crossing over uh, the Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and Israel, because the, the exit port of the, the corridor to the Mediterranean Sea will be Haifa. And then the third leg will be a maritime one uh, from uh, Haifa to Europe through the, the sea. And uh, for us, of course, Marseille will be the, 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 the main port, not the only one, but the main port of access to, to Europe. The idea is to, to increase the trade, to increase the solidarity, to increase the connectivity between all the countries around uh, along the corridor. Uh, there will be uh, railways on the land, of course. Uh, it will be very, very important. There will be uh, energy, energy uh, transport, uh, green power, and also green hydrogen. And also uh, data, uh, fiber optics cable from India to the Middle East to, uh, to Europe. 
the idea also is to, to help all the countries to uh, benefit from the, the existing uh, existence of the, the corridor to accelerate the energy transition and decarbonization of their, uh, of their economy. So, of course, today uh, there is the war, and so uh, the priority of uh, many countries is uh, the war and the end of the war and the peace. But the corridor, the IMEC, will be one of the major projects after the war, the day after the war, uh, to, um, to build something concrete, something positive, uh, in order to, to um, accelerate the, the links between all the countries uh, and also between Israel and the uh, Arab countries. Because I was going to ask you if the project is still relevant in this current geopolitical context, but you answered it perfectly. Perhaps, well, yes, uh, it is important to, to note also that India India uh, is, is not at the heart of our discussions today, but India is the, the emerging uh, empire of, of the 21st century uh, with a rate of growth which is one of the highest in the world, uh, with uh, the one of uh, Saudi Arabia. And therefore, um, connecting India, the largest populated country, the largest democracy of the world, to the Occident through the Middle East uh, makes sense. And... Uh, uh, in, in that order, the IMEC will change the ge geography of the world. It's not a project for the coming months, even coming years. It's a project for the coming decades and the coming century. Like the, the Suez Canal has been in the, had been in the 19th century, the Suez Canal uh, had connected Orient and Occident. That also the role of course, of a very modern corridor to do the same uh, in the 21st century with the, the, the DI make. Uh, speaking of you know, the future, um, how can we effectively encourage and ensure greater private sector engagement uh, in advancing the global agenda? And if, if I may start with Abdullah, if you, especially that you just did a signing between a private and a yes. public. Uh, so basically, uh, of course, to deliver all these, uh, to deliver the main objective to become a logistic hub, we need to develop the infrastructure as well. And what we did with the ports, we actually, um, uh, there is an investment of $4 billion that was also done in uh, participation with the private sector uh, at the first stage. Uh, but also when we looked at the logistic park, uh, we, we also looked at our international partners, uh, where we signed ag agreements to establish logistic park. Uh, of course, with, one of them is uh, sitting with us, a CMA CGM, a uh, global uh, shipping line, a uh, strong partner in Saudi Arabia and the port. Uh, they will establish their logistic uh, park in the port with an investment of 130, billion, uh, 130 uh, uh, million dollar. Uh, so that's uh, what we do. Uh, we partner with the private sector. Of course, there are a lot of opportunities uh, across the kingdom uh, in multiple uh, stages uh, or and sector as well. Patrice, if I, if I might also ask you the same question with regards to that. Just, I think... That's okay, walking, yeah. Thank you so much, and first preliminary comments. Uh, as my neighbor said, we are very pleased, I'm very pleased this morning to represent CMECGM and our chairman, Odolf Saadi, because we have a strong partnership indeed with the Saudi Kingdom, and for me, being born in Marseille, seeing the director of the port engaging further, with uh, Saudi authorities are really delightful, and also the fact that our head office, CMECGM, are based in Marseille, this is great. Uh, no need to say how much we love at CMECGM what we are looking at with Saudi Arabia, but also with all the other Gulf countries, the six GCC countries. We share their vision and we support their ambitions. To come back to your questions, first and very simply, when geopolitics are becoming more and more complicated, uh, agility is key. Agility is a strategic asset. It means, in other words, that risk aversion, risk aversion is not the best recipe 
for business, for success, and for creating development, economic growth, and political and social stability. Uh, second, supply chain. Everybody knows what is a supply chain now since pandemic. Nobody knew before. Uh, supply chain is a very demanding industry, strategic industry, because resilience of the economies, because of the need of economic sovereignty and development, as I just said. But the sea is complicated. Maritime transportation is complicated. I was talking about geopolitics. You were mentioning with Jean Mestralli some geopolitics. Look at the Red Sea. Uh, sea is also complicated because of climate change. Before it was mentioned sustainability, look at the Panama Canal. So maritime transportation is a demanding industry. Air, air is key also, air transportation, and we are also strong partnerships with the various companies of the Gulf countries. Uh, but look at the pandemic. What about the next pandemic? We see that now the explosion of the air transportation because of the booming of the uh, e-commerce and good for everybody. But if tomorrow, unfortunately, we have to face another pandemic, all the bellies of the passenger planes will be stuck on the ground again. So it makes a balance between risk and opportunities again. I come to the ground, logistics and corridors. Uh, at the end of the day, nothing new. It would be pivotal, it would be strategic, but corridors and now the, if I can say, the, the beauty contest for corridors all over the planet is also strategic. And this is a good news. This is a good news because I'm talking about complementarity between maritime, land and sea. Definitely. And we are seeing that in Africa with the interland. We are seeing that also in Latin America, in Europe also, you know, Northern Europe versus South Mediterranean. And we come to the key hub of tomorrow of the Gulf countries. Today, CMACGM, we are, uh, we are having 41 maritime services uh, entering the connections. If I just talk about maritime services, entering the connection between the six GCC countries and Southeast Asia, China, Far East, uh, West Africa, East Africa, North America, Latin America, Europe, of course. And it's just a beginning. Uh, last year, the volumes, the containers transporting in and out for and from the six GCC countries were more or less 200,000 TUs a week. CMECGM, we have transported all the year long a bit more than 4 million TUs. So we see this is domestic market, the ambitions of the countries and the authorities of all the six countries, and on the driving seat, some of the ones, because of the map that we saw, and we're partnering with all the port authorities and key stakeholders on the ground. But once again, agility, sustainability, um, engagement, no risk aversion, being bold. When we see at the entry point of the IMA corridor from India, yes, pivotal strategic, when we see the exit point, we need to be very ambitious when we look at the situation on the ground. And no need to mention Lebanon also, which is a very key country for us, for CMACGM. And uh, fair enough to talk about IFA in the current circumstances, but we have also Mediterranean terminals from Egypt to Lebanon and also from Eastern Mediterranean, of course, to Marseille. Thank you very much. So it's going from uh, sea to air now to rail, uh, Zahi from Alstom, I mean, I know that uh, you've got ongoing projects and potential projects in the region. Uh, can you tell us more for the future of infrastructure and transport corridors? Yes. Yes. Um, so, first of all, I would like to, uh, to say how much um, I'm really delighted to, to contribute to this panel. Uh, to bring this view um, from the rail transportation perspective, um, so, first of all, uh, as you, know, you may know, Alstom is a mobility solution provider, sustainable mobility solution provider, so one of the leaders in the world. Um, so, we've been present and we continue to be present in that fantastic region, the GCC with all the uh, Gulf countries, since more than 14 or 15 years now. Uh, we've started with the uh, Dubai tram, so uh, uh, in service since 2014. Uh, the first catenary-less uh, tram system. Uh, we've carried on for sure with the uh, Dubai Metro, uh, so the, uh, the driverless uh, metro solution as well, belonging to our uh, uh, product portfolio uh, of Metropolis range. Uh, for sure, uh, we, we've carried uh, out as well projects in Lusail, uh, tramway of uh, Lusail, so in Qatar. 
uh, always bringing the uh, most advanced technological uh, solutions as well and sustainable solutions. Obviously, in Saudi, uh, we, we are uh, involved, deeply involved in, uh, in, in, in Riyadh metro project, four lines out of six, uh, which will uh, be uh, put in service uh, soon, uh, this year, hopefully. Um, and we continue, in fact, supporting all the visions uh, of the different countries. So I've been listening carefully uh, to the previous uh, panel as well. Um, and Alstom policy is fully linked to those visions, which means sustainability, uh, passenger comfort, I would say, and uh, well-being on board our solutions, trains mainly. Uh, just to take some concrete examples uh, regarding the latest generation of the uh, double-deck, very high-speed trains, uh, we are uh, putting in service uh, with our uh, so national client in France, SNCF, but we are uh, proposing it as well uh, to all the other uh, people and uh, operators and clients interested in uh, this kind of uh, sustainable, uh, very high-speed trains solutions. Um, Alstom has inf invested massively in innovation and research and development during the last eight years in order to uh, make enormous progress and improvement in terms of sustainability. Concrete example, um, the power consumption of this train has been reduced by 30% compared to the previous generation, which is massive for such a vehicle. Uh, transporting uh, around 650 passengers, which means 20% more than the previous generations as well. So you can see clearly that uh, Alstom Vision as well is clearly connected to uh, all the uh, uh, orientations and visions of, of the Gulf countries. Uh, and we are somehow um, reconducting uh, uh, transportation models that were really successful in the other regions of the world, uh, for sure in France, uh, which is well known, but also in Europe, uh, we have uh, very high speed trains running in more than uh, 20 uh, different countries uh, in Europe and in the world. Uh, and we would like really to, um, I would say, transpose or export as well this model because it is really uh, a benefit uh, in terms of uh, sustainability. Um, and um, I would say, a solution which is shortening the distances somehow, because in some examples, when you have a dedicated very high-speed line, you are dividing the travel time by two, so which is huge. And this is helping really uh, uh, the countries and uh, the economies to develop more and to push the people as well, uh, I would say, from airways transportation mode, from cars transportation mode, to the rail transportation, which is more sustainable and uh, I would say environment friendly. Speaking of, of economies and, and as a banker, uh, Charles Emmanuel, is the liquidity available for large infrastructure projects in the Middle East and will it mostly come from banks or other players do you see in the future? Yes, Ali, thank, first of all, thank you for inviting me for, to this panel. I think it, uh, it is um, useful, I hope it is useful to the audience, but I, I give my perception as a banker as to uh, what, what, has going on, what is going on. Sorry. Uh, first of all, let me say that I'm impressed by the way uh, the GCC countries have developed their infrastructure over the last 10, 15 years. Yeah. And uh, I mean, some of this infrastructure is uh, sometimes at par, if not better, than what that we have here in Europe. And this is a combination of two things. First of all, the I would say the political willingness to uh, carry out this uh, giga project, but also uh, it's a matter of having the, uh, the financial means to uh, support uh, this project. And I think it is very important for everyone in the room to keep in mind that the, the, I would say the financial situation or financial standing of the GCC countries can be quite diverse. Uh, just as an illustration, uh, uh, in terms of ratings, and I know that it is a, a sensitive topic at the moment, but uh, Qatar and the UAE have a, a, a ratings which are similar to that of France and, and the UK. Uh, Saudi Arabia is similar to Spain. Oman is uh, similar to Greece, and so on and so on. So, of course, these, uh, all these countries, uh, they have carried out or they will carry out Giga project, but they don't necessarily have uh, the same uh, uh, level of liquidity and financial means uh, available for this project. Um, to me, it's not a matter of if this 
projects are going to happen. It's really more a matter of when and how. And this is where uh, 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 I think your uh, question is very relevant. If I can take two minutes of your time on this. We, we, we're talking about projects which are uh, literally for not tens, but some, sometimes hundreds of billions. Uh, project financing or infrastructure financing typically requires 20 to 30 percent of this amount as equity. And the quick question uh, to uh, the people you are talking to in the, in, 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 the, in the GCC or elsewhere is where is this equity going to come from? Uh, I think it is really important for everyone to uh, fully understand the strategy of these countries when it comes to infrastructure and the role that the sovereign wealth funds are going to, to play in, in that respect. Um, Qatar, UAE are clearly uh, at a more advanced stage in terms of their infrastructure. The, the, the bigger elephant in the corridor, if I, if, I, if I can use this English expression, is really Saudi Arabia. And, and we know that Saudi Arabia uh, recently has been extremely uh, active in promoting these uh, giga project. Uh, the PIF, of course, is playing a key role. And the question is whether the PIF is uh, ready and able to support some of this project and to which extent. And this is a key question also for the local authorities to try and make the environment as conducive as possible for uh, international investors. Again, because we are talking about uh, billions of equity, uh, there's a global competition, and when I say global, it's not only GCC or Europe, it's everywhere around the world to attract uh, foreign direct uh, investments. Uh, there's clearly more demand than offer, and that's why it's really important for these countries to, uh, to, 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 to make an investment uh, uh, in infrastructure uh, as compelling as possible for, for, the large, uh, for the large project. Maybe one quick word on financing. Financing follows equity, actually. So it's important first to understand where the, where the equity is going to come from, and if uh, the project is well structured, makes sense, then you will find banks who are going to uh, finance this project. Uh, it's important to bear in mind that international banks are a bit less liquid at the moment due to the uh, uh, overall uh, market environment. There was a lot of liquidity around uh, which has tightened sorry, uh, quite substantially with the increase of interest rates. So they tend to be uh, much more uh, uh, selective on the, on the project they finance. Uh, and also they are uh, looking at the uh, geopolitical situation in the Middle East. And this creates, uh, I would call it, a flight to quality. So they will be more selective and they will work only on those projects uh, 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 strongly supported by the sovereign with uh, uh, stakeholders they are uh, comfortable with. And we see now a, a move that uh, is quite new, uh, which is the fact that uh, GCC banks are very liquid again, and they are ready to support these initiatives. So you should expect to see more banks from the GCC financing this project in the GCC, but also in Europe, and less international banks, even though they are ready to look at the, 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 the best project for sure. Thank you. And on, I mean, quickly, just to have from each of you just a, an insight on what's next for the region when it comes to the future of infrastructure and transport corridors. Uh, before we unfortunately have to quickly end this panel. Yes, so uh, basically last year, uh, also His Royal Highness Crown Prince uh, launched uh, 59 uh, logistic zones that, has, that are across uh, the kingdom, basically also to contribute and to be a key enabler to achieve the objective. And these will be available as well for the private sector uh, to be developed. Uh, and some of them also shared with the government as well as an opportunity. So this is one of the projects that is also coming uh, at this stage. Yeah. Patrice? Thank you. Uh, echoing what has just been said also, uh, and very rightly, I think. Um, a vision and a political willingness, I think personally and professionally, are also more important than cash. Cash is not an issue, for sure. 
but uh, having a vision and having a political determination are even much more important in the current moment where geopolitics are so complicated, I think. Uh, if we term, secondly, in terms of cash, sustainability as a group, because it was personal commitment, responsibility from our chairman, CMECGM has invested roughly for his fleet of six and more than 600 vessels, more than $15 billion in the last 10 years for decarbonization, investing in new energies, and it's just the beginning, and we'll do it, and we'll cope with the agenda of uh, the COP28, especially where we were with the different stakeholders. But at the end, regarding this issue also, and it leads to my third point, who pays? So far, regarding our fleet or investment, this is us. But this is why we are developing partners. But at the end, especially for a private family company, a CMECGM, the client is king. Uh, when we ask at the final consumer, our big clients, who have more or less 65,000 customers all around the world, from West Coast to uh, Far East, everywhere, uh, some companies are ready to pay the decarbonization. But the huge majority is still asking why and how, no, up to you, up to the governments, up to the funding, up to the banks. So it will be a challenge. And last, uh, digitalization. Uh, because also we are talking about services, customer cares, uh, time is key. Delivering in time, especially when we are talking about the booming of e-commerce, etc. This is where the, the right policy mix between sea, air and land for logistical hubs, from dry ports to rail, from airport to, uh, to terminals, maritime terminals, and the right policy mix backed by a strong political vision will be pivotal, I think, in the coming years, wherever in the world. Thank you. Zahi, going back to land? Back to earth. <laughs> so, um, no, I, I would like just to deliver, the, again, the, the message. So. Um, the infrastructure project, so the, the, the upcoming project in, in this area of the world, I would say, has to be built. We know that we are talking about uh, investment for a century. Huh? So it has to be built with a, a long view, in fact, ahead. So long view ahead, and we are talking about sustainability and shortening the distances, etc., has to take into account uh, very high speed uh, infrastructure vision in order to build it for the uh, upcoming decades, I would say, and uh, to see one day those projects running in service and bringing all the benefits to the passengers, comfort, safety, and to the environment as well, in order to contribute uh, in a concrete manner to this transition towards sustainable uh, mobility. So uh, again, the, the message, uh, and I will finish with that, Alstom is ready to accompany all the, uh, I would say, transportation authorities in, in those countries and the, the government uh, representatives in order to advise and uh, to provide the, uh, the, the best of, in terms of expertise uh, of Alstom in this field, so more than 40 years expertise <laughs> in this field and experience, and especially uh, in the context of the GCC, uh, we know that uh, when we are running products uh, in these countries, uh, we are, uh, I would say, uh, aiming uh, in a high level of service, uh, in a robust uh, design as well, because uh, it's not a secret. Huh? We have a specific weather conditions in those countries, and the products delivered in those countries have to, uh, 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 must have the highest level of service and reliability in order to uh, deal with those uh, constraints, which are really specific and uh, need to be taken into account uh, since the beginning. Thank you. Charles Emmanuel, from the next steps with regards to where the money is going to be coming in for the infrastructure. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe a comment on sustain, sustainability because because it's a it's a very important uh, topic for uh, all of us. Um, Frankly, we, we see things in this region that we would not have seen even five years ago uh, in terms of the uh, ESG agenda. I mean, the, uh, the GCC has been perceived historically uh, uh, and unfortunately almost exclusively as, a, as, a, as an exporter of oil and gas, uh, and things are uh, changing dramatically and in a good way. Um, because the GCC, they want to show the world that they are very good citizens, 
as far as uh, uh, ESG uh, uh, is concerned, and that they want to play a key role in energy transition. And there are several illustrations to that. Uh, Qatar, for instance, very uh, recently, was the first issuer of a green bond. Uh, the final amount was 2.5, but the, the deal has been massively oversubscribed by the market. And it says two things. It says that, or it shows that there are countries which are definitely committed to this, uh, uh, to this uh, sustainability, and also that they are getting, if they, of course, explain the right story to the market, that they are getting a lot of appetite from investors to support this initiative. And there are other examples. I mean, we, 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 we've heard quite a lot about this uh, hydrogen project in Saudi Arabia. Clearly, we are at the very beginning here because there's a whole ecosystem to build around uh, hydrogen and there will be a, a, a supply chain to build around uh, hydrogen. Uh, we see a lot going on in uh, the renewable space, solar, of Obviously, as far as uh, the GCC uh, is concerned, and, uh, and our, uh, I would say, French national champions have a, a lot to play here, be it uh, EDF, be it NG, be it uh, Total Energy, and so on and so on. And we were talking about uh, 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 shipping, the shipping industry. We also see a, a LNG bunk bunkering project in the region, which I think is really important for, for, for the big players like CMS, CGM, and, and, and the others. So there's a lot going on, and in my opinion, uh, the best is yet to come as far as infrastructure is concerned in the, in, in the region. And this is a topic which is, of course, very, uh, very uh, uh, important to all of us. And uh, as a banker, uh, we will be very happy to play a, a, a role uh, in this transition. Thank you. The best is yet to come. I think uh, that's a wonderful way to end this panel. Gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for participating. And thank you to the audience for your patience and time.